All right, let me share my screen first and see if I'm doing it right because this usually take, I'm I'm a little bit challenged when it comes to technology. You know, so. <laughs> no worries at all. I'm here to help out with that. Um, we see your presentation, um, and you can yes, if you hit that. So right now we see the next slide. If you go up to where it says display settings at the top, you should be able to make it um, presenter swap to presenter view. Yes, sir. Okay, that looks perfect on our end. All right, so this is my name, Dr. Al Jarushi. I'm one of the pulmonary critical care attending with WVU Ruby Memorial. You know, I have the pleasure to talk to you about lung nodules. You know, uh, I'm just going to go straight with my presentation just for the sake of time so we can have more time for questions. You know what I mean? I have no disclosures. Uh, usually, I would like to start with the definition, you know. so. How we define nodules, it's an opacity, it's a lesion in the CAT scan that you can see. And it has a very well-defined borders, you know. Most of the time we would, love, we would love them to be round, but a lot of time they're not, you know, just an opacity, you know, within the lung parenchyma. Usually the size is like three centimeters or less, you know, if it's more than three centimeters, we call them uh, masses for some reason, you know. But definitely, I mean, if it's more than three centimeters, the, the risk of being cancer is very high, that's why we call them masses, you know. But anyhow, so it's an opacity within the interstitium of the lung. If it's attached to the pleura, we would like to call them pleura-based nodules, so they're not part of the lung. If they're attached to the mediastinum, we think about them as a lymph node, you know. So usually, by definition, it has to be within the interstitium of the lung, within, you know, the tissue of the lung, you know, and has to have a very good, well, you know, borders, well, circumcised borders. And the other thing, you know, as I said, if it's attached to the pleura, that's not a lung nodule, that's a pleural nodule. If attached to the mediastinum, could be a lymph node, could be something else, just to let you know. The question what to do with them, you know, I hate to say that, but the simple answer refer them to us, you know. We have a multidisciplinary clinic, thoracic oncology clinic every Tuesday morning. If your patients, you know, I know this is an outreach program, so if your patient lives like three, four, five hours away from Ruby Memorial, and he lives within the state of West Virginia. You know, we can do a phone encounter, a virtual encounter. Send us the CAT scan. We'll be more than happy to review them. Usually, we'd love to have them if they're eight millimeters and above. This is a very high risk. And those, this is the time that an expertise has to make a decision. Uh, when you put the order, if you're within WVU program, you know, you just go to Epic Orders, and you just write Thoracic Oncology Refer, and then specify that you want the patient to be seen by a pulmonologist because the default they go to a thoracic surgeon. We would love to see them first, to evaluate them, you know, and then if we think that this nodule has to go out, we'll send them to our thoracic surgeon. At our thoracic oncology clinic, you know, there is an oncologist, thoracic oncologist, a thoracic surgeon, and one of us, one of the pulmonologists sitting every Tuesday morning. And we do discuss all the cases, you know what I mean? So it's a very good multidisciplinary, you know, clinic that we will make a very good decision, shared decision with the patient, you know, and our outcome is always good, honestly, because I always believe that if you have a multidisciplinary, you know, decision-making capacity within your health system, it's always a good care for the patient, you know. Anyhow, so so it's more complicated than that, so I'm going to go through uh, some definitions here. The first question I ask myself anytime I have a nodule, is it single or multiple? If it's multiple, a lot of time we think it's less malignant. We think about more of benign process going on within the lung. The next question is, is it solid or subsolid, you know? The next question is, is there any calcification within the nodule itself? And then the size, and as I mentioned before, you know, if, if you have a size of eight millimeters, you know, we start to worry, please send those, those patients, you know, we'll be happy to take care of them. And it's not about the nodule itself. A lot of time we think about finding within the CAT scan, but you have to put the nodules within the patient perspective, you know what I mean? So, if you have a patient like, for example, with a terminal disease, you know, or the life expectancy very low, you know, and the patient won't even understand, or he will stand, you know, uh, conscious sedation. I mean, if you put him through conscious sedation, he will end by being intubated or he even, even die, you know. So if you have a, a patient with a terminal disease, otherwise he won't benefit, you know, from further investigation, you know, and he won't even stand, you know, like uh, full anesthesia, you know, due to terminal disease, whether cardiac, or pulmonary or any other terminal disease, you know, I don't think it's good to what they call to go through all of that. So the best thing is just to 
or have type of kind of an end life decisions, you know. So we do we do what they call evaluate the patient as a whole. You know, we don't evaluate the nodule itself. So we put the nodule within the perspective of the, of the patient himself. You know, so uh, history is very important. You know, so it's always history, history, history. You have to know the detailed history of your patient and the current clinical status. That would help to know the differential diagnosis. You know, also it would help whether to assist to do a biopsy or to do a follow-up CAT scan. Those are the options usually, you know, whether to do a follow-up CAT scan or do a biopsy or not to do anything about it, you know, so not to even bother, you know, so. Any prior CT scan of the chest, it's a very important question. I think whoever is a board certified in internal medicine, the first question they would ask you, if you have a lung nodule, is, is there any prior CAT scan, you know? And then if you have a solid stable nodules for two years or a subsolid, meaning ground glass opacity for more than five years, no further evaluation need to be done, you know. When I think about nodules, usually I ask myself, are those nodules incidental nodules? And if it's incidental nodules, we use the Flishner criteria, and then I'm going to go through this Flishner criteria. The next question I ask myself, is it a part of a lung cancer screening? We screen a high-risk patients, you know, so this is a different type of nodules. We use the RADS, the uh, the, with the American Radiology Association, you know, they have a RAD system specifically for lung cancer screening. It came about, you know, when, when we start having the lung cancer screening, you know. In the past, we used to use Flechner criteria because we didn't have a lung cancer screening, but now we have a RAD system. I'm going to go through it later on, uh, <coughs> specifically for the lung cancer screening, like the RAD system that you have for your breast cancer screening. If you have a history of current cancer or recent cancer, and you think the patient has metastasis to the lung and there's a nodule on the lung, this is a different patient. So I would like to group my nodules into incidental, where I use the Flechner criteria, lung cancer screening. If your patient's a part of a lung cancer screening, we use the RAD system, what to do with those nodules. If there's a history of recent cancer, it's a different ballgame. Let us say the patient has uh, renal cell carcinoma and he would be a candidate for surgery. The only thing that he has a nodule in his lung so we'll have a good discussion with the urologist, with the oncologist, you know, and see if that's the only metastasis that he has. Usually, if you have a single metastasis to the lung, we call them oligometastasis. And a lot of time, you know, you, you would take them out with the primary cancer, and this would be a curative intent to the, to the cancer as a whole, you know. So as I mentioned, you know, you have to put the, the nodule into the perspective of the patient as a whole here, you know. The things that we fear the most is the cancer. A lot of time... All those guidelines, they're meant to be to, to rule out cancer or early treating cancer, you know. So again, if it's incidental, we're going to use the Flechner. I'm going to go through, the, through, through some slides here with Flechner. If it's a lung cancer screening, we reuse the RAD system. If there's a history of recent cancer, it's a different ballgame. We have a detailed discussion with the patient, with the oncologist, with the thoracic surgeon. And if the patient has oligometastasis from the colon cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, any other cancer, you know. And we think that could be a curative just to take that spot out, two or three spots out. And we think the patient will live with the healthy. I mean, he can't breathe in his own without a ventilator and he has a good lung reserve. We'll do that, you know, so. So I'm going to start with the incidental. A lot of time, you know, don't, don't, we don't like to jump into, you know, flesh and criteria before we ask, you know, the patient questions and history, history, history. So it is all about history, you know. Connected to disease, you're going to ask your regular, and vascularize, you're going to ask your regular question in history, you know. So does the patient have arthralgia, arthritis, skin, you know, uh, lesions, skin nodules? Does he have any sinusitis, asthma-like symptoms, you know? Is there any history of rheumatoid arthritis? You know, rheumatoid arthritis is the most prevalent disease, you know, when it comes to rheumatology. But the lung complication secondary to rheumatoid arthritis is not as common. But because there's a lot of patients with rheumatoid arthritis, we see a lot of lung complications, you know. And one of them would be a lung nodules, you know. Uh, the other thing we ask them about, if they have a cloudy urine, a lot of time with vasculitis, you can have nodularity in your x-rays. Those going to be granulomas, you know. And a lot of time, you know, if you have the lung is affected, the kidney will be affected. So a simple question is like, do you have a cloudy urine? Your urine become cloudy. And then you do a, a simple, you know, urine examination where you look for proteins, you know, and RBCs, you know, Def by definition, you have glomerulonephritis, you know. So history plays a very important role. It's not very common, you need to see a lot of vasculitis. We do see, you know, some rheumatoid arthritis as well. The next question that I always ask myself, is the patient's immune competent or immune compromised? So if you have 
couple of nodules, you know, and you're immune compromised, we always think about infection, you know, and we tend to be very aggressive. Our protocols, guidelines guide us to do bronchoscopy with biopsies, with washing, with brushing. We send for serology. Serology, fungal culture, acid fast light. <clears throat> we send for all serology for uh, opportunistic infection. You know, so if the patient is immune compromised and they have nodules, even they're asymptomatic. You know, because a lot of time if you're immune compromised, you don't respond to infection like if you have a normal immunity. So a lot of time you're just going to have some infiltrating your lungs, and you ha you have no symptoms or a little bit of minimal symptoms. You know, so we tend to be more aggressive with those patients, and we have to rule out infection big time. You know. A lot of time, if we have an incidental nodules, you know, I always like to ask the patient if you had flu-like symptoms within the last two months, pneumonia-like symptoms, because a lot of time you can have atypical pneumonia with nodularity of your lungs. And very much all what you have to do is in eight weeks, 12 weeks, you know, cats can follow up. If everything clears up, you don't have to do anything about it, you know. Incubational history, we live in West Virginia. A lot of people, they work in the mines. Coal mine or pneumoconiosis is very common here, you know. Or history of any exposures, does the patient has a farm? He's, you know, he 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 is <clears throat> exposed to haze, hot tub, you know, bird vision. Here we think about his uh, what they call a hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So uh, it's more than that, you know. Uh, differential diagnosis is very wide when it comes to the nodules, even if it's, it is incidental. You know, you have to think about other differential diagnosis: infection, inflammation, you know, uh, uh, his, what they call a hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Incubational history is very important, you know what I mean? The next thing that we would love, would like to do with the incidental nodules, we have to look at and assess the risk of malignancies, the things that worries us the most gonna be, is this nodule gonna grow into a malignant nodule, you know what I mean? You can see here by age, you know, the older you get, the chance of having cancer is higher, you know? The size, the same thing, you know, if it's more than two centimeters, it goes up to 80% chance of being cancer. This is why we would like, we always love to start with within eight millimeters. So if you have an eight millimeters nodules, you know, I think the best thing to do to sit into a dedicated long nodule clinic, we call it T onc T thoracic oncology clinic, you know. But usually we we take care of the long nodules there. It's every Tuesday morning, you know, we are wide open. You can send this patient and load us as much as you want, you know. History of smoking, history of other cancer will increase your risk of lung cancer, the size, the speculation. And, and the lobe, you know, and we use all those numbers to dial them into a uh, into a uh, a calculator, and then we calculate whether the patient is a high risk or low risk for lung cancer. Again, if you have an incidental nodules, the first question that you're going to ask is: it single or multiple? What is the size of the nodules? Is it solid or subsolid? <clears throat> and then we run the calculator that I mentioned above. You know, we run all those data, and then we see whether the patient is a high risk or low risk. You know. Nodule morphology is very important. Irregular nodules carries a high, you know, risk of cancer, like this one. It's a lobulated nodule. This is speculated nodules. So the risk of cancer is, goes from 30% all the way to 100%. We look at the calcifications, as I mentioned. If it's diffused, central, laminated, popcorn, mostly it's benign. It's granulomas, you know, a hematoma. We don't do a follow-up CAT scan. If the patient has... Uh, eccentric or stippled calcification, this could be malignant. So those are the nodules that would we'll love to follow them and take care of them. You can see here there's an e eccentric calcification in this CAT scan, this one as well, and here there's a central calcification. Most likely we're dealing with, <clears throat> with malignant pathology here. Here we're most likely we're dealing with benign pathology, you know. Fleshner Society Pulmonary uh, Nodules Recommendation. Dr. Fleshner, unfortunately, he's a radiologist who died before he went to the meeting, there was a meeting, I think, in Switzerland in 1968, if I'm not wrong. And a couple of radiologists they decided to do a retrospective studies and make sure not everybody get a CAT scan to follow up. You know, not just at that time, most likely in the 60s or the 70s, the CAT scan was very expensive. So they're looking for lung cancer probability less than 1% not to do a further CAT scans, you know. For, and they named it after Dr. Flushner, who unfortunately had a heart attack before he joined, you know, the meeting. So this is why, the, this is where the Flushner Society came about, you know. The lastly, it was updated in 2017, you know, and we used the calculator to see the risk of uh, this nodule being a malignant nodule, you know. Low risk, less than 5%, intermediate between 5 and 65, and high is more than 65%. If you go to, to Google and just write, like, like, lung cancer calculator, there's a lot of them. The one that I usually use is the Mayo Clinic calculator, excuse me.
So again, we're talking about incidental nodules, you know? So if you have an incidental nodules and it's solid and you run the, the risk calculators and it's a low risk, you don't have to do any further workup. So if it's tiny, less than six millimeters, no further workup needed if, the, if it's a low risk. If the single solid nodules and the patient is a high risk, we would like to do a follow-up for, uh, for 12 months. If it didn't change, we don't do further follow-up. If it's a single solid nodules, but it's a little bit bigger between six and eight millimeters, a low risk patient or a high risk patient, most of them would love to have stability of that nodules. Remember that you can develop cancer, not even smoking, you know, I think the prevalence of adenocarcinoma or other cancers, non-smoker patients like one in 250,000s, you know, so you're still at a risk of lung cancer even if you haven't smoked, you know, it's one out of quarter million. So this is why if you have a large nodule, we would like to follow them and make sure they're stable after two years. After two years, if they're stable, the risk of malignancy goes less than 1% as per Fleshner criteria, they don't want us to follow them anymore, which I agree with. And then if it's more than eight millimeters, so again, we're talking about a solid nodules and a single nodules, you know. So if it's less than six millimeters, it depends. Differently, you have to see whether the patient is high risk or low risk. If it's between six and eight, you know, we would like to see some stability. But if it's more than eight, as I mentioned before, this is the patient that we would love them to have in the clinic because the decision would be like to do a further CAT scan, short-term CAT scan, you know, within three months or a PET scan or tissue sampling, regardless whether the high risk or low risk. This nodule is big enough to be worried about, you know, and we would love to have it in our clinic, you know. So, and whether to do a PET scan or a CAT scan or do a sampling, it's a clinical decision. We put on the perspective of the patient himself, you know, how he looks like, what is his breathing test. Sometimes we go all the way to do a cardiopulmonary exercise stress test. We're not sure whether he would stand sigmatectomy, lobectomy, pneumonectomy, you know, so a whole, the whole lung's taken out. So we go all the way to do a cardiopulmonary exercise test, you know, and we see if we can uh, aim curative treatment for not nodules if we think it is cancer, you know what I mean? And now we are back to a multiple solid nodule. So we talked about the single nodules, and here we're talking about incidental. We're not talking about lung cancer screening. Lung cancer screening will screen a very high risk patient, you know. We already know that those patients at a higher risk of lung cancer, we use the RAD system. Those meant to be for, you know, incidental nodules, you know. A lot of times the nodules in the lung, they're overlooked. If you get a stroke, you'll be like focusing or you get any head trauma or anything, you know. It'll be, if you get a CTA of the neck, usually they, you're gonna capture the upper lobe of the lung, you know. And this is where a lot of bad nodules happen, you know. A lot of times those nodules can be missed, unfortunately, 10 to 20% of them, later on they can develop into cancer. So it's very important to follow up incidental nodules in the lung period. A lot of time you get an abdominal CAT scan and they're gonna pick up the lower lobes part of the upper lobes of the lung. And then you're gonna have a nodules and this nodule gonna be missed because we overlook stuff. You know, we can be focusing on the acute abdomen. We'll be focusing on soft tissue, you know, aorta, coronary angio, angio, C, coronary CT angio, you know. So we'll be focusing on the coronary arteries and then there will be a incidental nodule which will be missed, you know. And this could be very dangerous because those nodules, they can develop into cancer later on and the patient will be burned, you know, so that's not, not a good thing. But anyhow, back to the to the incidental nodules. So if you have multiple on solid and the patient is the low risk, as I said, if you have multiple nodules, we think about them less likely to be cancer, but though they can't, one of them can be cancer, you know. So if the patient is a low risk, we run the calculators again, we don't have to do any routine follow-up. If the patient is a high risk, we do a 12-month follow-up, the nodules less than six millimeters. If the patient has multiple solid nodules, more than six millimeters, you know, if he has a low risk, we would like to have a two-year stability because there's many nodules, but some of them, they're more than six millimeters, you know. If the patient's a high risk, we would do a short term, and then we, ha we have to confirm two-year stability of the nodules. This is a very important statement. If you have multiple nodules, but one of them is acting up, you know, because you can never tell whether one of this nodules that's acting up, meaning increasing in size, or looks more uglier, it has more speculation, is a different pathology from the multiple other nodules that you see, you know? So usually if we have multiple nodules, but one of them is acting up, we'll be focusing on that nodules. We'll, be do, we'll do a PET scan just for that nodules. We'll do some sampling just for that nodule. Sometimes even we'll do sigmatectomy, and then definitely we'll follow up the other nodules because you never know whether there's one pathology or two pathologies just to let you know. 
If you have a subsolid ground glass opacity, if it's single, you know, there's no require there's no requirement to follow up. <laughs> Especially if there's less than six millimeters. If they are single and but they're more than six millimeters, those tend to be indolent, slow growing cancer. We would like to have a five-year stability. Usually we'll do first CAT scan within one year. And then we'll do an annual or every two years, but you need like a five, five year stability for those cancers, you know. <clears throat> if you have a multiple subsolid ground glass opacity, you know, if they're less than six millimeters, we would like to have at least, you know, four years stability. We'll start with a short term follow up and then we follow them up, you know, sporadically here and there until we have a four year stability. If you have multiple subsolid nodules and they're more than six millimeters, you know, we, we, we always need to to have three to six short-term follow-up, and then we continue to follow up. And then we manage up uh, according to the suspicion, meaning if there's a nodule that's acting up, looks suspicious, it's very hot, it's very big. We continue following it, you know. A lot of time it's very difficult to biopsy those subsolid nodules. I had a couple of patients, they look big, they look ugly. I send them to the surgeon, they took them out, it was cancer, you know. So if you have multiples, but we just focus on the one that's acting up. We're not ignoring the other ones, because if you do a CAT scan, you're gonna see everything. Uh, within the system of WVU, you know, we're trying to bring a software. One of them is the Lung GPS. We're looking into it, you know. It's an artificial intelligence that runs in the background of the radiologist. So this will read the radiology report and pick up anything that says lung nodules. Not only that, this artificial intelligence has capability to run, a, to run into the PAC system. The radiologist can run it and can pick up any nodules that the radiologist missed as well. And this software will bring us everything into a platform, you know, into a queue and a cases and a case manager, you know, or a case navigator can initiate through the software letters that goes to the PCP, family doctor, you know, and to the patient himself and tell them, hey, you had a CAT scan of your head and neck, you had a CAT scan of your abdomen, we've, or you had a CAT scan of your aorta, we found an incidental nodules, you know, this is the measurement of it, and this is what it looks like, and this is how it looks like, and this is what you should do about it. and then. We, we we rather them to follow up with their primary doctors and just follow the Fleshner criteria. But if it's eight millimeters, we rather them to go and see their local pulmonologist. I would be very happy, you know, to have them here at WVU. But it's a very good software because at least ten to twenty percent of those incidental nodules they grow into a cancer. And nothing makes me unhappy, you know, honestly and sad, you know, when I I see a patient with a big mass and then I go back in history and I try to collect, try to collect all his radiological data and I found like. There's a nodule that was seen, but nobody acts upon it, you know. So the incidental nodules, they tend to be very dangerous and they tend to be forgotten for one reason, I think, because we will order a CAT scan for another reason other than the lung itself, you know. And a lot of them happen in an inpatient setting. So I think having a software like this one, this one, there's a lot of a lot of other commercial software, they do the same thing, you know, but we're trying to buy and purchase this one to catch all those incidental within our system. Lung cancer screening is different. Usually we screen high risk patients. And the tools that we use to screen how, we use two, two risk factors actually. We use the age and pack of smoking. There's other risk factors like history of emphysema, female, you know, actually female patients, they can, they can be younger, they can have less amount of packs of smoking and there'll be a higher risk of developing cancer. The same thing with African-American, you know, but yet we have one size that fits all. So when we screen patient, we use, age and what they call a pack of smoking, but we don't use like a female patient, African American patient, or even Asian young ladies, they are higher risk of developing cancer, you know, even with a younger age, with a less amount of smoking. I think medicine very soon gonna be moving into individualized, personalized medicine, more than of one size that fits all. But anyhow, when it comes to the lung cancer screening, we usually use the age and the pack of smoking, you know. The NLST, the National Lung Cancer Screen, though, they were the first one who did a big trial, you know, and there was a reduction in mortality, 20%. There is a downside of it, you know, because you will be over-diagnosing nodules that benign. You'll be doing a lot of stuff to those benign nodules and nothing, nothing need to be done about them. Meaning you'll be capturing a false positive nodules thinking those are cancer. And then sometimes you go all the way to do surgeries, you know, like sigmatectomy, you know, taking those nodules out and they turn to be a benign. The things that we hate the most when you send the patient to a surgeon and you take a nodule out and it's benign, that's not a nice thing. After that, the European, you know, I think it's in the Netherlands and Belgium, 
they did the Nelson trial. Here they were looking at the vol vo volume more than the size of the nodules. And there was a 24 reduction in mortality, you know. This is the NLST, you know, this arm you have the, the, the number of cancer that they know, you know, and this arm you have the years of randomization. And within eight years, you can see here, there's a separation, you know, of the, uh, of the two curves that, right? So there's more people got, we, we start catching more cancer with, with CAT scan, low dose CAT scan. And if you look at the graph underneath, you know, the uh, the one arm is like the, the mortality, the other arm is the randomization years, you know, so within eight years, there's the, the reduction in mortality with, with uh, what they call, with the CAT scan arm. And this is where all societies, you know, they start picking up on lung cancer screening. I got this from uh, CDC, you know, this, I felt like it's a very nice descriptive, you know, chart, you know, so, or a picture. So in the year 2020, look at the number of people died because of cancer and convert those to colon cancer, pancreatic cancer, breast cancer, prostate, liver cancer, you know, female and male equally. In West Virginia, actually the, the common and number one diagnosed cancer is lung cancer. And number one reason for to die, you know, nationwide is lung cancer, honestly, you know. We do have a tool to diagnose it early on and try to save some patients. Hmm. Number need to be treated. You need to screen 320 patients to save one life, you know. A lot of time you think this is a, a big number, but it's not a big number, honestly, when you take, I don't know how many millions of smokers, you know, high, at a risk of, of lung cancer. So you have to screen 320. But look at the next number, you'll be surprised. You need 1,250 colonoscopy to save one colorectal patient from one colorectal cancer. So you have to do more colonoscopy to save one life. When it comes to the lung cancer, you just have to do 320, you know, uh, low dose CAT scans, serial CAT scans, you know, to save one life, you know. When it comes to mammography, you need 1,400 you know, mammography is over 13 years to save one life, you know. So if you want to bet your money going to be, you know, into a lung cancer screen. But unfortunately, the enrollment in West Virginia, I think, when we, when we looked at the data, is about 4 to 10 percent. And nationwide, you know, there's a lot of lung cancer screening, but it was not picked up. Lung, lung cancer mortality is going down, I think, because of the lung cancer screening and the improvement and the immune checkpoint, you know, therapy that we have. But it's always good to diagnose cancer early on. The U.S. Preventive Service Task, they changed their recommendation. Now they start from 15 instead of 50 years, 55 years before <clears throat> to 80 years old, you know, 20 pack of smoking, you know, and you, meaning again, you, ha you haven't quit or you're a current smoker or you have, or you quit within 15 years, you know. So if you, if you start, if you start the screening now, but you quit 10 years ago, you'll be screened only for five years. Because the time that you have a 15 years clear of smoking, you stop, you know, the screening thing that, you know, is not worth it. As I mentioned before, we use the RAT system, you know, zero, that means incomplete, or we have to repeat the study, or part of the lungs is miss missing. Uh, RADS one and two means that RADS one is negative, RADS two is benign. You do a one year annual follow up. If it's RADS three, you know, you do a six month shorter follow up. But again, as I mentioned, whether it's incidental, or rats for A, B, or if there's an increase in the size. Sometimes you do a CAT scan and the nodule is like six millimeters. After a year, now it's nine millimeters. So this is a growing nodule, you know. So you have to act upon it, you know. From four millimeters to six millimeters, this is a growing nodule. So you have to be more aggressive with it. If it's growing, you know, you still, you're still thinking about, you start thinking about, you know, cancer, you become more suspicious about cancer, you know. Those are the rides for that we always love to have in our clinic. If you have an expertise within your local area, send them. You know, the decision what to do next is very important. You know, uh, most of the time it's a shared decision between you and the patients. As I said, we look at the breathing test, the exercise stress. Sometimes we do an exercise stress test. You know, we look at the six minute walk. We look at the patient would stand, you know, sigmatectomy, lobectomy, pneumonectomy, because this is the curative aims, right? If it's early stage of cancer, your aim is curative, you know? So there is other stuff that we can do. You know, if we think this lung is suspicious, we cannot do anything about it. You can do radial ablation, you can do cyber knife, you know, so you can burn it out actually. So the question, if you have a nodule, whether it's incidental or a part of uh, lung cancer screen, what to do with it, you know? And very much those are the options, you know, to beat the imaging, do a PET scan. The PET scan for me as a pulmonologist, it's not about the nodule because if it, the nodule is hot, that could be an infection, you know, hot nodule 
avid nodule, you know, it could be anything else, you know. But for me, as a pulmonologist, I look at the lymph nodes. So there is a PET scan positive lymph nodes, that means I'm going to go and do an EBUS and do bronchial ultrasound, ultrasound the lymph, the mediastine and the hyaluronic lymph nodes. And we start sampling because you're going to hit two birds with one stone. You're going to make a diagnosis of the cancer, and then you would do staging as well. If the cancer is outside the thoracic cage, you know, meaning because we did, we did a PET scan for a big nodules, and it's outside the thoracic cage, you will biopsy the furthest point from the what we think is primary, you know. And then you do sampling. Do you do a CT guided biopsy, which is you come from the outside, and you put a needle, you know, so you're gonna you're gonna penetrate the pleura. Anytime you penetrate the pleura, there's a risk of pneumothorax. The risk of pneumothorax goes all the way to 20%, meaning two out of 10 patients that will develop pneumothorax. And then usually they use they use a very bigger needle when you do the CT guided biopsy. So there is a risk of bleeding as well. Surgery, you don't want to send your patient directly to the surgeon, you know, and have a segmentectomy or lobectomy. If you're not 100%, no, I mean, it's very difficult to say 100%, but you have to be have a very high suspicious of cancer, you know, to send your patient. You have to use the calculator. You have to see a growing of the, of the nodules. The nodule is too big. It's a mass, you know. Before you do that, very much, you have to make sure that, you know, doing everything else, you know. And even before you send the patient to the surgery, does the patient have a good cardiopulmonary reserves? to go through, you know, uh, sigmatectomy because they, when you do the surgery, you have to drop one of the lung. And the patient will be bleeding from one lung while they're operating with the other lung. At the same time, you're going to take a big portion out of the lung out, you know, after you exhibit the patient is able to breathe on his own or you're going to need the ventilators, you know. So we, we put all of those in perspective. So we always love to have, see them first before we, see, we send them to a surgeon. A regular bronchoscopy, your rate of, the, of diagnosing nodules depends on the size and the location. It's range between 30 and 60 percent, I'll say, you know. And then with a large bronchoscopy, you're not going to go further than third or fourth generation of the bronchi. With ultrathin, more or less the same. But navigational bronchoscopy came around 2004, you know, it was FDA approved. When I did my training 10 years ago, I trained with the electromagnetic navigational bronchoscopy. I thought that's a, a beautiful invention, you know. You can see here, this is a radial radial probe EBA. So you go with your regular bronchoscopy, and then you have a sheath, and the sheath has a guiding. And then you have a navigational system. After you do the mapping, and after you do the registration, the software will develop a navigational system, like a GPS system, that you use in your car to drive. And then it will tell us whether to take a right or a left, a right or left, you know, turn up or down, which area to, to follow. And then gonna bring us all the way as close as it gets to the nodules, you know. But everything is virtual here, you know. And we don't actually once once you pass the, this blue bro uh, locator guide, this blue bro, you know. Once you pass it, you don't see anything. You're gonna be relying them to the virtual imaging, those two virtual imaging, you know. And then once once you think that you're close enough to the nodules, something looks like this. We take the the guide out, and then we pass a radial EBUS, which is very much an ultrasound. And then if you have a beautiful picture like this, we have a decent confirmation that we are within the area of the nodules. And then we pass our tools, which is going to be a needle, a forceps, you know, and brush. Or something. And then at the end, we do some washing, you know. So the cons are about electromagnetic, you know, you're using electromagnetic fields. If there's a lot of metals in the room, there will be distortion of your pictures, you know. <laughs> the other thing, there is something called CT to body diversion. Remember, we do this is software that takes the CAT scan that was done into the CAT scan room where the patient is being asked to take a deep breath, hold your breath, and then the patient will get a CAT scan. After we intubate the patient, put them under sedation, you know, continuous general anesthesia, you're going to lose some lung volumes. So the nodules will move. So whatever planning that you had, there's at least 10 to 20% diversion. You will be missing the nodules, you know, just because of nature, you know. So this is one of the big cons, actually, of having, you know, of doing this, what they call it, electromagnetic navigational system, uh, uh, bronchoscopy, you know. So there's always something called significant CT to body diversion. It's all about atelectasis that happen after intubation and things will be moving, including the nodule, the lung size will shrink, you know. So a lot of time we ask the anesthetologist to give them a high P and give them a higher tidal volume than we give somebody else you know, who's in the ICU, you know. While we do in our procedure, we, do, we use fluoroscopies like an X-ray. But the fluoroscopy is one dimension, one plane. So you don't know whether you're anterior or posterior to the nodules or on top of it or behind it, you know. So you see, you're thinking that your nodules, you need to go into the nodules, but you don't know whether you're anterior or posterior to it, you know what I mean? So 
there's some studies done about it, you know, so the agnostic yield is 73% overall, you know. If the nodule is too small and the patient is breathing, just imagine this is the nodule and this is your needle and the patient is breathing. There's a lot of sampling error. So if it's negative, we're not 100% negative. I mean, if it's positive, you know, we sure it's positive. So the negative predictive value ranges from 70 to 60%. It's not good, you know. So you're going to have a lot of false negative. Even if it's a false negative, usually we follow them. If the nodule is growing, we send it to a surgeon to take it out, you know. Complication rate is usually lower when we do biopsy from the inside of the lung because we're not penetrating the pleura. The risk of bleeding, perforating, you know, or puncturing the intercostal artery and vein is less. You know, there's less pain. The patient wakes up, he goes home the same day. Within the last three years, you know, robotic, you know, bronchoscopy came into place, you know, so there's two systems here. There's the Monarch and there's the ION. I had the pleasure, you know, to be the first one to do the ION, you know, robotic bronchoscopy within the system of WVU. So it's something looks like this. So we have the, this is the tower. This is the console. It's like a, a PlayStation console. It's like you're playing, you know, a game. And this is, will be fixated to the ET tube, to the patient tube. The patient will be intubated. And then you're going to navigate. You're going to use the navigation system. But the good thing about this robotic, you know, number one, you're not touching the, you're not touching the bronchoscope. This is a robotic bronchoscope, meaning you will be running the bronchoscope from the console. Everything is fixed, you know, with the, with the older system. You have to hold it. Somebody has to pass the instrument. So it's like two people has to operate on it. This one, very much one, one, one person can operate on it, you know what I mean? <clears throat> and the other thing is what they call it. You have a camera at the end. So we have the virtual, and then we have the actual camera. And then we use the navigation of the virtual system to drive all the way. And with this ultra thin scope, you can see it here, you know, we are able to go as deep as we can, you know. So the same thing, we take the CAT scan, we upload it to a, a computer that has a software, they use something called remote sensing, where the software will, will sense the airways and dry and, and draw like an, a tree of an airways. You know, we always like an ultra thin one to two millimeters, and we like to have 200 slices or above. You know, the more slice of the lung you have, the better, and the thinner is the better. So you can have a better, you know, what they call drawing of the, a better airways, you know, mapping, or the software will read more airways. And this airway is going to navigate and drive you as close as it gets to, to what they call to the airway. So it's something new. I think the outcome is better than the old system, you know. Uh, the ion, you know, there's some studies that was done about it. So you can see the yield is a little bit higher, you know. But remember, the smallest, if the nodule is smaller, you know, the oldest the yield is going to be, it's not going to be as good, you know. A lot of things happen, you know. The patient's breathing. So there's, the nodule is very tiny. So there's a lot of sampling error. You need to go into the nodules or not going to go. It depends when you're going to catch it. You cannot stop the patient from breathing. The patient typically will die, you know. So, so you're doing a procedure while the patient is breathing and the nodule is very small. So sometimes you puncture the nodule, sometimes you can on top of it, behind it, in front of it, you know. So even with the navigational system, there's nothing perfect. There's nothing 100%, but 80% is a good number, believe me. You know, negative predictive value is higher than the older ele ele electromagnetic navigational, 72%, you know. Overall complications, more or less the same, I guess. Monarch, there's no head-to-head, -head, you know, comparing Monarch to ION, you know, but we don't have the system. You know, I was trained with the ION. I'm just going to talk a little bit about our experience. Probably we had more than 100 cases between us and thoracic surgeons. Uh, I trained one of my fellows. Now he's an attending with us. Dr. Harun, he does it as well, you know. We had more than 50 cases. Uh, I have an initial data, you know, we, we did 21 cases. I collect this initial data before we had, we, we've done more. We, there's more than 20 just to let you know, you know. We were able to diagnose 10 cases with malignancy and negative cases. They were negative, meaning we just stopped there. We followed the patient with CAT scans. <coughs> there was one case was non-diagnostic. We had two pneumothorax, you know, out of, I think, 50 or 70 cases now. One of them required a uh, chest tube. The other one, we just did a, a serial x-rays. We sent them home the next morning. I'm going to give you two cases that we did within our hospital. So the first case this is a gentleman who has a history of pancreatic cancer, but he has a history of smoking and a history of histoplasmosis as well, you know. So differential diagnosis include metastatic disease or a new primary lung cancer. It could be a fungal infection. So this patient was sent to us, you know. And you can see here the CAT scan. So very much this lesion is sitting on top of the diaphragm 
on the left side and below the diaphragm, you have the spleen. So it's kind of a dangerous, but the good thing with the robotic system, it will draw the borders for you. It tells you how deep you can go before you reach a dangerous structure, whether it's a big vessel like the aorta or the pulmonary arteries, or even the, you know, the diaphragm where you have the spleen or the, or, or the liver, you know. So it was a risky case, but we were very confident with the new platform that we had. And we had a diagnosis. The patient had an adenocarcinoma of the pancreas, you know, and end of life decision was made just because we got some, some answers there, you know. Case number two, and this is where we get a lot of trouble within the state of West Virginia. A lot of patients, they're a coal miner, but they smoke in the same time. So they will have a nodules. You don't know whether those nodules are coal mining nodules. You know, coal mining increased the risk of cancer, by the way, as well. Or those nodules are high risk because of smoking. So anyhow, this patient, instead of sending it to a surgeon because the nodule looks very ugly, we decided to do a navigational bronchoscopy with the ion, you know, robotic navigation bronchoscopy. The dif differential diagnosis in this patient would be an infection, pneumoconiosis, meaning a nodule due to coal mining versus malignancy. And you can see the, the lesion setting all the way up in the right upper lobe, you know. There's, there's a good leading airways to it, you know. And there's some cavitation in here as well. So usually when we do the, the what they call the planning, we will try to target two lesions, you know, because you, know, you never know whether this is one pathology or two different pathologies, you know. So we were able to, this is actually an actual picture of the navigational system. So this is your GPS that takes you where, wherever you're at. This is like seventh or eighth generation of airways, you know. There's no way you can go with the regular scope, which is very, you know, very thick. This is like a robotic thin, ultra thin. And even we had a picture, you know, of the airways, how it looks like from the inside. It's very inflamed. Usually your airways has to be pink, glancing, you know, shining pink, you know, mucosa, but this airway is very inflamed. We were able to diagnose this patient with granuloma, actually, due to pneumoconiosis. So we saved him going through pneumonectomy or surgeries. And we assured him there's no cancer, you know. So cone beam, we don't have. It's like a CAT scan. So you can do a CT guided biopsy from the inside of the patient, you know. I think that's a lot of centers, they do them. We think that the yield goes up to 94% from 80%, you know. We don't have it yet. Some data said no, it's like 85%. So it's not that much different from where we use the fluoroscope when we do it. You know, anyhow, I'm going to go to the summary. You know, lung cancer screening is a paramount important to reduce mortality of lung cancer. Lung cancer is the number one diagnosed cancer in West Virginia. Smoking prevalence is very high, it's like 20% or more. You know, unfortunately, not a lot of people enrolled into a lung cancer screening in West Virginia. If you're a primary doctor, family doctor, PCP, please advise your patient. Or even if you have a patient inpatient, advising to go through those lung cancer screens is very important, you know. Uh, if you have an incidental nodules, hopefully you catch it. You know, we're trying to develop this GPS lung software that's going to catch all the incidental nodules so we don't miss them. 10 to 20% of them, they can tend to be cancer, grow into cancer later on, you know. Lung nodules evaluations and understanding of the risk management is very important. You know, there's a pros and cons. If you're too aggressive and you take a nodule out and it's benign, that's not good, you know. So we do a very good, you know, uh, multidisciplinary discussion of all those nodules, you know, Tuesday. It's like our nodules clinic. We have the thoracic oncology in the, uh, clinic in the morning. In the afternoon, we have uh, the thoracic oncology tumor board where you have the radiologist, the oncologist, the pulmonologist, you know, the thoracic surgeon, uh, the pathologist. A lot of people meet, meet, you know, and then a lot of time we make good decisions on those patients. And then we put them into writing, you know, into the notes, and then we send the letter to the patient, you know. Shared decision making. When you discuss with your patient, you know, lung cancer screening, you have to tell them the pros and cons. The cons are going to be over-diagnosing, overdoing stuff that shouldn't be done, you know. And this is why if they're not just like eight millimeters, it's always good to send them to the dedicated, you know, uh, medical center where they have a multidisciplinary kind of uh, uh, discussion and multidisciplinary decisions on the patient. We use the shared decision-making a lot. Me personally, I will tell the patient, I can send you straight to the surgeon. It looks very ugly. You know, the likelihood of being canceled, like 60, 70% is better to take it out. I can do a little bit short-term follow-up CAT scan, which I would rather not to do it because if it's cancer, can be to other place. I can do a navigational bronchoscopy, but there's a sampling error, you know, so, so it depends, you know, on the patient himself. So a lot of time we individualize the decision, you know, and we use a shared decision with the patient. So the new modalities like robotic navigational bronchoscopy, we're very happy that we, we got a WVU here, you know. Uh, the technology gonna go increase and going to go up, and there's, I think, Galaxy system coming out, 
you know, anyhow, that's my pretty much talk. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you so much, Dr. al -Jarushi. We really appreciate your time and um, all this wonderful information. So um, yeah, we'll open it up to the group for any questions and I'm happy to um, read out any chats that come through as well. A good, wait a minute, I wasn't my videos too now. Uh, good morning, quick question. Um, you, you, your lecture started with the premise of everything starting with a CAT scan. And in my world, I do mostly deal with black lung patients and almost everything starts with an X-ray. And my question is, um, when, you, when you have a nodule identified on X-ray, what's the current follow-up recommendation? Uh, a, two parts is one is there's, oh, I don't know, 20, 10 different flavors of chest CTs. And which one would you do for the initial follow-up? And the second question is, is there a place for chest X-ray follow-up alone, like where you would, you know, repeat it in three to six months at, to look for nodules size change, or is that um, approach passe? Thank you. I would do a CAT scan, honestly. I would do a dedicated CAT scan without contrast, you know. Uh, a lot of time you don't need a contrast, except if you're looking for a lymph nodes or you're looking for a blood or lesions, you know. Uh, the x-ray, we love them, you know, but it's not as a good, good modality as, you know, to diagnose anything, you know. Uh, me personally, I look at the patient if it's a very high risk, you know, definitely. If the patient had a pneumonia, sign of symptoms, and he's a low risk and there's a lesion there, I don't think, I, I do think there is a there is a, a room for to do a follow-up x-ray, you know. But if the patient is a smoker, a high risk patient, you know, uh, it's better to do a dedicated CAT scan, you know, and follow, follow up that nodule. So that's what I would do. Yeah, well, like my patients are almost all coal mine. Well, they're by definition, they're all coal miners. Um, so I'm starting with people that, that have a significant risk of pneumoconiosis. And that, that that's the population that I'm working with and just trying to figure out where, like, where, what the current recommendation is to go next. Yeah, I had like three patients. You know, I, I've, been, uh, I, I've been a pulmonologist in West Virginia probably close to seven years, going to my eighth years. You know, at least I had four or five patients. I would say like four patients well, they have co-worker pneumoconiosis, but they smoked a lot. So if, they if they're healthy enough to go through a lung cancer screening, I would order a lung cancer screening. And if there's one of those nodules acting up, you know, I will focus on that nodule. I'm not ignoring the other nodules, you know. And then I'll do more diagnostic, you know, whether it's a CT guided biopsy, uh, bronchoscopy, and navigation bronchoscopy, serial CAT scan. I mean, it depends on the case, you know. But at least four of too many, you know, Patient with cold work on pneumoconiosis or multiple nodules, four of them they tend to be cancer. Actually, one of them initially, the, the over two years, we did a CT card above here, did a navigation later on. Everything is telling us this is a cold work on pneumoconiosis, but the nodule continued to grow. The patient was a high risk, so we sent him to cardiology, they cleared him, they did all the workup, they cast him and everything, and then we took the nodule out. Within that nodule itself, there was cancer on the side, you know what I mean? So there was, I, would, I guess, a sampling error or the, the cancer was embedded within that big, you know, granulomas, you know, so so you have to individualize your cases, right? So if your patient's a smoker, you know, and he smoked more than 20 years and he's 50 years, I will enroll them into lung cancer screening, you know, that's a cheap way of getting, you know, CAT scan through the insurance, you know, uh, and that's what I usually do. If the patient comes to me, I do a counseling about lung cancer screening and I will do it. If they have multiple nodules due to cold work on pneumoconiosis, which is a big, big thing here in West Virginia, you just... If they're too small, nothing to be done about it. If you have an old CAT scan or even an X-ray, you know, and you know that nodule is located within that vicinity, you know, the CAT scan, and you can bear them, you know, it's very difficult to compare X-ray to CAT scan, but sometimes you can, you know. I said, okay, this lesion's been there for a while. I'm just going to continue doing the annual, you know, CAT scan screening for lung cancer, and, and that would be a good answer, you know. So, yeah, I mean, there's nothing straightforward. You know, every case, we treat every case differently, you know. Uh, but if I have a nodule in a high risk patient, meaning they smoked a lot, you know, uh, 20 packs and they're above 50 years old, I'm more aggressive, you know, I'm more lean to what they call it, to do uh, to do a CAT scan and then I review the CAT scan myself and then act up on it, you know. Is it small? What is the size? Do we follow? I mean, if you do a CAT scan screen, lung, as a part of lung cancer screen, you have to follow the rats. If you do it for incidental nodules, you know, you just follow the flesh you know. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Sure. Thank you for that question, Dr. Burns. Any other questions or comments from the group?
I'll do a nice long echo pause for folks to think about their questions if they have any. <laughs> Yeah, and as I mentioned before, if you have any patient, you know, you, you are within the state of West Virginia and your patient lives far away, you know, unfortunately, there's a lot of people difficult for them to come all the way to Morgantown, which is at the edge of the north part of the state, you know. We can do a, a lot of phone, phone encounters. You, all you have to do is just send us the cast scan, we'll load them, you know, we'll have a very nice chat with the patient, you know, we'll try to do a lot of stuff locally if we can, you know. Uh, but we're very happy to take care of those, you know eight millimeters and above nodules, you know. And we think we have a lot to offer, you know. We have a good dedicated thoracic surgeon. All what they do is just, just thoracic, you know. And I have all of them cell phones. Easily, I can call them at any time. I can send them an epic message, you know, to review the scans. And we always have this kind of discussion about our patients, you know. And I think that's the best outcome. When you have a good discussion between your surgeon, you know, thoracic surgeon and your pulmonologist, you know, so. Absolutely. That's really wonderful, too. So thank you um, for putting that out there to the group. Another um, thing I'll mention, too, is that with Echo, um, it's a wonderful platform for the providers to connect to. So a lot of the project areas that we have, we encourage the participants and providers from those other areas that aren't necessarily close to Morgantown to present cases at uh, these echo sessions so they can bring the patient cases and maybe even discuss with uh, someone like you, Dr. al on uh, these uh, sessions. So that's also really nice to do as well. Dr. Doyle, I see you raised your hand. Go ahead. I think you're still muted. Yeah. Oh, there okay, we go. Okay, I think I got it. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, this is kind of directed to Carl Wernz and to Lou Ann Jeffries. Um, because we've been doing a lot of LDCT screening over the years at Cabin Creek Health Center, and probably most of those positives are getting referred to CAMC. And Carl and Luanna, are, are you are you comfortable commenting about what kind of nodule clinic workup? Is there anything similar available in Charleston, which would be much closer for us? So just, I'll just give you <clears throat> from my limited information that I have on that. Um, typically, once the patient has the low dose CT and if it's a lung rad four, then the auto referral process that we have in place, um, there's a pulmonology group that will look at that in their tumor review board. And then they typically will decide whether it should be a PET um, a lot, most of the time I see PET listed, um, three months CT or, um, occasionally a bronchoscopy that they'll, um, put down on that. Now, once they see the patient, they may obviously get more detail, but I, I haven't seen, and doesn't mean it isn't happening, but typically on the, like the radiology report, those are the recommendations. Okay. Uh, Carl, any, any comment? Or I know I know Luann's one the one that really follows these up. So um, so, so the, the, I the, I mean there is my guess I the, I do not know about this but my guess is that Vandalia Health probably offers a parallel service down in the Charleston area with through some portion of CAMC or pulmonary associates or something like that um, with the you know the pulmonary tumor board but I don't know um, on a on a first part basis because that that is a uh, shifting landscape. So I, I actually don't know what the options are down in Charleston. I'm sure there is one. I just don't know where it is, how it exactly works. I would start with pulmonary associates. I need to send somebody though. Yeah, as I mentioned, you know, guys, if the patient lives far away and he lives within the state of West Virginia, after COVID, you know, we do a lot of virtual visiting, even a phone call visiting, you know, we take a detailed history and we collect all the data as much as we can. And then we try to do everything, you know, locally, wherever the patient lives at, you know, so uh, but if you have a local expert, I worked at CMC for two years, you know, when I left there, they were at the beginning of the, what they call the lung cancer screen. The only thing was missing there, there was no dedicated thoracic surgeon. I remember it was very difficult to convince the cardio thoracic surgeon, who, their main focus was to do a cardiac surgery, to do anything about my patients, you know, and there was one surgeon who would do everything, but unfortunately he retired, you know, but with the WVU, honestly, you know, I was happy to find that we have at least three to four thoracic surgeons that they're willing to do, you know, everything, you know, so they do a high risk cases, 
you know, and it's all about, you know, the early diagnosis, not only only early diagnosis, early intervention. And we go all the way to do a cardiopulmonary exercise stress test to make our patients surgical candidate. You know, so let us say the breathing test is not as good. If EV1 is low, the DLCO is low, but we still wanted to push for the surgery. We'll do a, a cardiopulmonary exercise stress test looking for the V.O2, you know, if it's more than 15 and mil per kg, you know, very much we tell the surgeon out, we're very confident, you know, you can't take this part of the lung out, you know. Uh, a lot of time you'll have a program, but the question is the end game is can I be the surgeon taking out this nodules out, you know. I, it's been a while, I've been out of CMC more like six years, maybe more. And I'm not sure if they still have a, if they have a dedicated thoracic surgeon group. Here we do have a thoracic, you know, uh, surgery group. All what they do, they do only lungs. You know, that's very much it, you know, so. Uh, but as as I mentioned, we 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 can do a phone call with your patient, or we'd be very happy to to talk to them, to chat with to, you know with them, and help them out with the lung nodules. So the other thing, I think Dr. Chapman, you know, um, he's the director of the Lucas, which is a truck that has a, a CAT scan that goes to the suburban West Virginia, all the way deep into the south of part of West Virginia. They do a lot of you know, outreach and they do a lot of lung cancer screening as well that comes to us as well, you know. If you hear about that bus coming toward you, you know, please send your patient here to get screened. Uh, Dr. al Jirashi, when you do the um, the telemed telemedicine consults, uh, pulmonary nodule consults for the for the long distance away patients, is that on Tuesday or is it, or do you arrange it differently? So our thoracic oncology clinic is every Tuesday, you know, and uh, what they call it. The default is to go to the thoracic surgeon, though I, we love our thoracic surgeon, but we would love to see the patient before, because as, as I mentioned, you know, if you are a hammer, all what you see is nails, right? So if you send a patient with a nodule to the thoracic surgeon, the first thing that comes to his mind, I want to take it out, you know. A lot of time they will send the patient back to us, but just to save some time, you know, Tuesday morning, send them, you know, to the thoracic oncology clinic, which is Tuesday morning, every Tuesday, you know, so there's like four of them a month. And what they call and specified to see by a pulmonologist, you know, there will be an attending with at least three fellows, you know, and we are very hungry and thriving to see more patients, honestly. But what about telemed? But what about when you do it's, it telemedicine? Yeah, the same, the same, you know, so, so you can schedule the patient to see us physically, meaning in person. If you look at the scheduling and if you're within Epic system, it says in person, telephone or virtual, you know, which is telemedicine, you know. So whatever is convenient to the patient. A lot of them, they don't have computers or smartphone or a good coverage. So we can do even a phone call visits as well. You know, we we'll talk to them. Okay, thanks. Thank you all so much for the comments. And uh, Luann chatted in the tumor review board at CAMC meets biweekly to discuss the LR4 patients. Um, they just informed me they'll be doing weekly meetings to review and schedule patients. Thanks for chatting that in Luann. And if you have uh, anything further to elaborate on that or anyone has comments on that, please do so. Alrighty, any final comments uh, or questions before I go into the announcements from anyone? Alrighty, well, first and foremost, just wanted to thank you again, Dr. Al Jarushi, for joining us today and presenting and um, answering all these questions. And thank you all so much for the questions and comments as well. It's very helpful and um, it's just sparks great discussion. So we appreciate you all. Um, the only announcement that I have is that our next session will be on July 17th. Um, and we'll have one of the participants, Cheryl Flynn, actually present on a study that she and her group conducted on virtual pulmonary rehab. So keep an eye out for that reminder. It should be really uh, interesting to see those uh, study results. And if you all can join again, that would be wonderful to um, support her and um, give feedback to her study results. So thank you all so much. And we'll see you all next time. Take care. Thank you.